Junction City by a Lancaster, Madison, calling Jeffersonville, 338, Sweetwater, Virginia, Rube. Calling cars 19 and 38. Proceed immediately to the corner of Cross and Jackson and make an investigation. I'll make a place for Calling you on the board of the Symphony Society. And, of course, I'll put you up at my club. Societies, clubs. All I want is the woman I love. It's time you faced facts, Jeff, and forgot all about this romantic business. Haven't I the right to live my own life? Surely you don't wish to hurt your mother. We want you to know that what we're doing is for your own good. For my own good. This is Mr. J.C. Any... Brown on Greenville, 35682. I'd like to speak to Mr. R.A. Dunbar at the Hotel Oxford in Birmingham, England, please. This is modern communication. Nerve system of the world. Spanning oceans as easily as it covers the miles from farmhouse to town. Yet without an unimpressive looking little bottle of magic, we call it simply the electron tube, there would be no communications as we know them today. The electron tube had its practical beginning in this humble laboratory, where a young man named Lee DeForest worked in lonely isolation. But the history of all the scientific achievement which preceded DeForest's work would be as difficult to trace as to uncover every withered root of a 2,000-year-old redwood tree. Suffice it to say, then, working on the flow of current in a vacuum, Edison and DeForest in the United States, Fleming in England. John Fleming succeeded in developing a two-element tube which detected the signals being transmitted by early radio experimenters. While the Fleming tube never came into general use, it is considered one of the ancestors of the modern electron tube. De Forest, like Edison and Fleming, later observed that electrical current flows readily from one electrode to another in a vacuum if a filament or cathode, as it is sometimes called, is heated. When the cathode becomes heated, electrons boil off its surface. If these escaping electrons are attracted by another electrode, their flow constitutes an electrical current. The amount of this current is increased if the second electrode, or anode, as it is generally called, has a sizable positive charge on its surface to attract the electrons, which of course are negative. This was the basis of DeForest's first tube, a two-electrode device, as was Fleming's. In 1906, DeForest observed that the two-element tube became more sensitive to electrical currents when a third electrode was added. This electrode, which DeForest named a grid, so improved wireless reception that the three-element tube was the heart of radio receivers installed for the 1907 world cruise of the United States fleet. DeForest was out in undiscovered scientific territory when he invented the grid-type tube. Many tests were made before he realized that his invention could amplify electrical currents as well as detect them. It then occurred to him that this amplification might be used to overcome the loss of volume in other types of communications equipment. At the time DeForest was experimenting with his audion, a long-distance telephone call of a couple of hundred miles required a healthy pair of lungs. Hello? Oh, all right, put him on. It's a long distance, please. You better close that door. And the window. Hello? What? Yes? Who? Gilman? Oh, Hilton. No, I can't hear you. Oh, Hillman, get a little closer to the telephone. In October 1912, DeForest took his Audion to the Western Electric Company's engineering department. Could the Audion be used as a telephone amplifier? Well, yes and no. The Audion was unsatisfactory as such because, among other things, DeForest had not removed enough of the air and the electrons from the filament collided with air molecules inside of the tube. Because of this, the full grid effect was not utilized, and thus the grid was not effective enough to control accurately the flow of current. Just the ordinary air we breathe, present in the audion, 
formed a gyrating mass, resisting the flow of current from one electrode to another. Western electric scientist, headed by the late Dr. H.D. Arnold, began a coordinated effort to make the audion practical. Realizing the tube was no better than its vacuum, they investigated special techniques developed by research workers in other fields and succeeded in adapting them for their purposes. Thus, they were able to evacuate the audion to a much greater degree. In other words, to create a really high vacuum. This important step allowed the electrons to move around freely. It was the prime objective of the Western Electric Engineering Department, as it is of the Bell Telephone Laboratories today, to transform ideas into utility in the interests of better telephone service. Thus, DeForest's early audion became Western Electric's practical electron tube, an efficient piece of communications apparatus ready to take its place in the telephone team. This very tube in 1915 brought transcontinental telephony, making any corner in America only as far as your nearest telephone. How was it possible in such a short period of time when it had taken centuries to develop the bare fundamentals of the tube? Even the ingenious De Forest had struggled for years in lonely isolation, fighting not only the barriers of science, but also an unsympathetic public. The answer is found in the unique association of the Western Electric Company in the Bell system. Then, as today, this unusual association afforded the coordination of many scientists and engineers working together toward a common end. Schooled in close team play through which their telephone network had been so efficiently woven, they concentrated on refinements and developments of the audion, just as they had on other improvements of telephony. By this cooperative effort, progress leaped ahead instead of inching forward. What would have taken centuries more, perhaps, was funneled into a few short years of coordinated progress. Byproducts of the electron tube were many. Radio with its powerful social influence. Radio telephony for such important assignments as police duty. These remarkable achievements of the electron tube, and others too numerous to mention here, ushered in a new era of convenience and better living to which we casually refer as the electronic age. How does this magic bottle work? Well, the tube and its essentials is relatively simple, consisting of an evacuated glass bulb with three electrodes, a filament, a plate, and between them, DeForest's ingenious grid. When the filament is heated, Electrons, nature's elementary particles of electricity, boil off. Being negative, electrons are attracted by the positive plate. Their flow constitutes a current of electricity. Now the genius of DeForest enters. By making the grid alternately positive and negative, the flow of current is greatly increased and then proportionately retarded. In effect, Charges placed on the grid produce greatly magnified images of themselves, and the tube thus acts as an amplifier. But how does the electron tube help long-distance telephony? Well, telephone current carrying your voice impulses grows weak with distance as it travels along cables. The weakened current enters the tube, charges the grid, is then reinforced on the plate. The re-energized current now continues along its swift journey on the speech highways of the telephone, just as it was at the source. Today, we talk across the country as easily as next door, and we wonder how we ever got along with anything less. Now let's imagine what would have happened if the obvious course had been followed to talk from coast to coast. It's all very simple. All we need is a pair of instruments connected by two wires and a source of power. To extend the range, all we have to do is increase the size of the wire and increase the amount of power supply. So by simple reasoning, we could have transcontinental telephone service if the wires were thick enough, if they were widely separated and adequately supplied with power. Of course, the wire would have to be the thickness of a fire hose. Nevertheless, two people could talk across the country this way. Of course, if we were to attempt to duplicate the coast-to-coast -coast channels of today through this simplified process, oh, let's forget it. There isn't that much copper or power in all of America. 
To keep your voice alive as it spans continents or leaps oceans, Western Electric's busy shops make millions of electron tubes to the Bell System's exacting specifications in many sizes and shapes, each designed to do a particular kind of job in the best possible way. These conventional tubes go into long-distance telephone circuits. Big babies like these are used in radio broadcasting. Heart of every modern radio station is the high-powered transmitting tube. Basically, this tube is not far different from DeForest Audion. It has a filament, a plate, and a grid. Note how deftly this worker assembles the lacy grid structure in this small tube before being sealed in its envelope of glass. And there are hundreds of others this big, or this big, all made to serve the country's needs in communication. The war heaped great responsibility on the shoulders of scientists and engineers. They designed scores of electron tubes expressly for the Army and Navy. One, the Western Electric 6AK5, enabled guns to aim more accurately. These queerly shaped magnetrons are significant examples of electronic science to which Bell Laboratories contributed greatly during the war. They generate electrical vibrations by the thousands of millions each second, creating the pulse for radar. Radar and radio, underwater detectors and gun data computers. These were the eyes, the ears, the predictors of our victory. And when it came time to turn out the plowshares of peace, the great strides made by our electronics engineers were applied to better telephone service. Here is the ANTRC-6, a radio telephone system developed and used during the war. Here, as many as eight simultaneous telephone conversations were relayed from station to station, from island to island. Modified and out of battle dress, the ANTRC-6 became the radio telephone relay system, speeding from hilltop to distant hilltop, the telephone messages and television programs of a message-hungry world. In the future of communications, as in the past, the telephone and its servant, the electron tube, is destined to play a mighty role. For global peace and security can thrive only in a world of universal understanding. And to help fulfill this high ideal, the latest and surely one of the greatest inventions of man is the electron tube, a bottle of magic.